What I'd like to do for you this morning is just basically discuss around my approach to managing reproduction in dairy herds, and in particular in, in very large dairy herds. And it's an approach I've found to be very successful over the years, and it works very well. So these first couple of slides are just a couple of, a couple of pictures. And this is a very large dairy herd in the Pacific Northwest in America, 7,500 cow dairy herd. And that's actually the fresh cow pen. And there's a couple of Mexican guys working with the fresh cows. That is a, a stomach tube, which I hope you're all familiar with, with your cows. But that is actually a water bowser and a generator attached to it. Now, back in the days when I worked in practice, I was very fond of stomach tubing cows. But if I did two cows in a row, one after the other, I was ready for cardiac resuscitation. Okay? These guys will do 20 cows, sometimes 25 cows, in the time it took me to do two. But at any one time, they'll have 300 cows in that fresh pen and could be carving 40 to 50 cows a day. So there's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resource going into doing this and trying to do it quickly and efficiently. And the question I would ask you is, why are they doing that? Why are they putting so much effort into those fresh cows with the, the stomach tube here and then also with this truck? This is the front line of the pen. And that truck contains all the goodies they'll need for those cows. The antibiotics, the anti-inflammatories, you know, all the stomach powders. There's a supply of water there. They're not going to walk back to the office to get the stuff. They're going to do it there and then if a cow needs it. Okay? So what are they trying to achieve here? Well, what they're actually fighting for, although those two little Mexican guys don't know it, is they're fighting for the metabolic stability of those cows. They're trying to hunt out fresh cows early in lactation that have become metabolically unstable and they're trying to correct that. That's their objective. <coughs> because in these dairy herds, they recognize that to leave cows metabolically unstable has dire consequences for both reproduction and milk production in the lactation that's about to happen. And that's what those guys are trying to achieve. Everything's there and the encouragement here is if a cow needs something, she gets it. The needs of no cow will be overlooked because of human oversight, even though they've got over 7,000 animals on that site. And that's the objective of what's going on in this fresh pen with this intensive monitoring system. And what you've just seen in those uh, couple of pictures is part of the management of this life cycle of the cow, where we breed cows, we produce heifers, those heifers go into a rearing system, they calve, they come into lactation in the herd, they go through several sequential lactations, and then eventually we harvest their body weight. That's the process, that's the bio biological system that you're all trying to manage day to day, and you're trying to manage that system to produce a profit. But while you're engaged in that system every single day, all this stuff's going on all the time around us. There's researchers right around the world that are looking for ways that we can manipulate and alter that biology in a favourable manner. And that involves nutrition programmes, reproduction programmes, various treatment protocols, new drugs, new feed additives, etc, etc. And as producers in the industry and consultants, we need to be aware of what's going on there. Because those will become the opportunities of tomorrow. Those will be the technologies that we can use to enhance the production and profitability of the dairy herd. So in any dairy business, well, in actually in any business worldwide, you actually have a profit level in that business. Okay? And that's what I've represented on this slide just with the black line there. So you imagine your business, that's your current profit level. Now at some point during the year, you might recognise that you've got a problem with some aspect of your business. And very commonly, that might be your ability to get cows in calf. You might have a problem with reproduction or mastitis. That means that what you've done is you've actually broken the biology of that system. Well, that system's running well, your cows stay healthy, they get back in calf, everything goes along quite nicely. But at some point, if it's not working well, it implies that we've broken the biology of that system. So as a manager, what would you do? Well, you'd go out and correct the problem, wouldn't you? You'd go out and find a way of fixing that. And in fixing it, you're trying to restore your profit level to its previous level. 
Okay? But you also might have that current profit level, and you might seek to improve that by identifying some of those new opportunities. You might want to try the latest synchronization program. You might want to try the C16s. You might want to try the latest feed additives. But there's a word of warning here, and a big word of warning. If you try and take new technologies and use them to fix biological systems that are broken, it doesn't work. Okay? If you're down here, in this area, dealing with fundamentally broken biology, and I will come on to sort of define that a little bit more as we go on, there is absolutely no point in trying to use the latest feed additives, the latest drugs, the latest synchronization protocols, whatever you like to fix that. You will not get the return on investment. Where you get the return on investment on those products is when you're here. When the biology is ticking over nicely and you can go in and make that investment and then expect a return and to move your business to a new profit level. And I suspect as many of you in the room today would like to improve your herd reproduction because you recognise that that would move your business to a new profit level. But if you're here, there's some fundamental basic things that you need to do yourself on your farm. You don't need somebody to come to your farm and sell you a new feed additive or sell you a new synchronisation protocol because they won't work. So when we go into a dairy and we try and assess the reproductive performance, we're actually looking for two things all the time. We're looking for consistent performance and we're looking for capability of performance. Okay? So basically, the guy tells you or the dairyman tells you that he does certain things. Does he do them? Does he do them every day? And does he do them well? How are you actually going to assess that? Well, this slide is actually the pregnancy rates and the insemination rates actually from quite a large dairy. And the two black dotted lines here show the pregnancy risk, the pregnancy rate, and the insemination rate. And I've put those black lines in just to show that this is around 17% and this is around 55%. And I think we could all agree that that dairy is remarkably consistent in its performance. So when this guy says to me, oh, I do this to detect heat, or this is what I do to get cows inseminated, should I believe him or should I not? I would say looking at these results, yes, I should definitely believe him. But also when I look at this information, it's actually quite capable. This guy is almost managing to average a 20% pregnancy rate. That's actually pretty respectable, that's okay. And again, I can conclude from that that the management of the biology on that dairy is actually pretty decent, and those cows aren't broken. We have consistency and capability. What about this? This is actually the weeks of the year along the bottom, and this is the conception rate that was achieved in that week. It's quite a large dairy herd. And just for reference, again, the black dotted line is about a 35% conception rate. So you can see for the vast majority of the year, this guy's conception rates are really nothing very much to brag about. Okay? So, is this guy capable? Is he consistent? He's obviously very inconsistent, but there's a sparkling moment here where he actually achieves some capability. If you walked onto this dairy, would you actually believe what the guy told you? If he told you we do this to detect heat, we do this to get our cows pregnant? How consistently does he apply that? And is he actually capable of applying it? So those are the two things we look at when we look at dairy herd records. We look for consistency and capability. And it's very often easier to work with a situation where it's incapable, because that often involves just staff training, rather in a system that's capable but inconsistent. So I spent a good part of my career walking on to, to dairies in various parts of the world and saying to people, what do you do to get your cows pregnant? Describe to me the process that you go through to get a cow pregnant. And you have to be engaged in that process every single day. And these are some of the common things that we come across all the time, areas where things can be improved. 
And the top one's actually pretty straightforward. Detection skill sets, I've called it. This is your ability to AI and heat detect cows. You can contract hire that in. You can actually get machines to do it, although you've still got to have a guy to AI cows. But either way, there are fairly straightforward things you can do about, about that. That's really about resources and staff training. No problem there. What about this herd check frequency? How often you PD cows? There's absolutely no doubt you'll be more successful at getting cows pregnant the more often you find the open cows and do something about them. Yeah? So most dairy herds, they might be on monthly, they might be on fortnightly pregnancy checks. You can actually achieve a benefit there simply by moving to weekly preg checks if local resources and local working practices will allow that to happen. First breeding window, voluntary waiting period, and I'll talk about this a little bit more. I've got some, some more slides on this, but when do you start breeding cows and how disciplined are you about that? Again, if somebody tells me they operate a 50-day voluntary waiting period, do I believe them or not? Where do I go and look for the evidence that that is the case? And what's going to be the impact on that herd if they don't? Re-enrolment of open cows. What do you do when you find an open cow at pregnancy check? What do you do to get her in calf again? And I've been guilty of this in the past in my career. We look at those cows, we scan their ovaries. Oh, she's okay, she'll come on heat, etc., etc. I can stand here and tell you now that in the UK, certainly over the last 10 years, cows that were treated actively when they were found open generally take around about 10 or 12 days to be re-inseminated. Those cows that are left to cycle on their own it's generally around 35, 36 days before they get re-inseminated. So they're not going to get pregnant for another 20, 25 days, and you can argue about the, the economic value of those days open. Big one for me, if we want to get cows pregnant, control your production disease syndromes. This is really mastitis, metritis, and lameness. They have a big impact on your ability to produce pregnancies, bigger than you would realise. And actually, all those diseases have their origins here in the transition health management of the herd. You know, for many years, we actually believed that managing sort of conception rate in dairy herds was really just about vaccinating those cows. We give them their BVD and their lepto vaccines, and ooh, the conception rate didn't go up. But it wasn't about that. It was all about the actual overall transition health management and about trying to keep those cows metabolically stable. So I want to give you a bit of an overview about where metabolic stability really starts to, to fall down, or at least the most common point in the lactation cycle where it falls down. And over the years, we've had this thing called a dry period, where we dried cows off, we left them dry for a period of time, and then they calve in again. And we've had this dry period because we recognised that it had benefits both on udder health in clearing infections and on milk production in the next lactation, Cows with an appropriate length of dry period actually give more milk in the next lactation. But as time's gone on, we've now moved to this kind of thinking, where we have a, a far-off dry cow, a close-up cow, and then a fresh group. And you've got to ask yourself the question, why are we doing that? Because cows don't know which group they should be in. Cows have absolutely no idea. But the reason we do this is we're actually trying to manage the metabolic health of these cows. We're actually trying to manage their metabolic stability. Because what's actually happening to these cows at the point of dry off, they're heavily pregnant, they're late in pregnancy. So from this point here, dry matter intake starts to decline. And it's actually dry matter intake that keeps our cows metabolically stable. But more critically, we enter this period of time here, the close-up period, the three weeks before calving, and we start to see some precipitous falls in dry matter intake in our cows. And you've got to ask yourself the question, what causes that? Well, actually, that's caused by the physiological state of the cow. She's pregnant. She's got all those hormones associated with pregnancy swimming around inside her. And if we allow them to, they will produce precipitous falls in dry matter intake. And it's those falls in dry matter intake that cause the metabolic problems in these close-up cows. It's where we see issues with things like negative energy balance before calving and problems with cows at the point of calving. Yeah? So this fall in dry matter intake 
is going to happen. It's biologically programmed by the state of pregnancy. And we'll be left with a cow here at the point of calving with a residual appetite that is the result of whatever we've allowed that dry matter intake to fall to. So if that cow calves with a decent appetite level, we can expect her dry matter intakes, if we manage her correctly, to actually rise quite sharply. But the point is for these fresh cows, they're no longer pregnant. So all those hormones associated with pregnancy that have been restricting that cow's appetite are now gone. There's now no natural biological restriction on that cow's ability to ramp up her feed intake. It's all management driven. And how rapidly we get these cows to rise in dry matter intake post calving is almost exclusively down to how well we manage that cow. It's all down to human intervention. And that's what you were seeing in those first couple of slides where we saw those fresh cows in those pens being very intensively managed. They're trying to encourage those cows to ramp up their feed intake as quickly as possible so they stay metabolically stable. Again, I like to think of this in the close-up period. As we have a cow that's losing her appetite, she's losing her desire to feed. And that's because the hard wiring in her head is being disrupted and pulled apart. That sort of wiring that gives her that desire and drive to go and feed is literally being pulled out with sockets. What you're trying to do with a fresh cow is re-establish that wiring, put those links back together. Okay? A fresh cow, quite literally, has to learn how to feed again. And you can train them to do that. And that's what you're actually seeing in those first two slides, was that dairy's attempt, their method, their system, of trying to make sure that those cows are rising in dry matter intake fast enough so that they stay metabolically stable, get back in calf, and produce an absolute shed load of milk. So following on from that, if we actually go into a dairy herd, what we actually find is that we can actually split the cows in that herd epidemiologically into roughly two streams. So we take this as our dairy herd, our population of cows, and they're all just calved. And then what we actually find is that those cows either come down this pathway or this pathway. So cows in this pathway here will conceive before 150 days in milk. They'll be pregnant again by 150 days in milk. Yeah. Cows in this pathway, we observe, do not become pregnant until after 150 days in milk, and often a long time after 150 days in milk. And then if we go and look at these cows to see what's actually going on in these cows' ovaries, we find that these cows here have had their first ovulation after calving before 30 days in milk. These cows have not had the first ovulation after calving until after 30 days in milk. The first ovulation after calving is a clockwork event. It happens seven to 14 days after the cow has returned to positive energy balance. Absolutely nailed on. Cow returns to positive energy balance, seven to 14 days later she ovulates for the first time. The point about this first ovulation is the vast majority of them are silent. The cow doesn't tell us that it's happened. She doesn't express heat, she doesn't come in heat. Okay? But we do get a signal from the cow as to which channel she was in. Yeah? And it's this at the bottom here. We observe that these cows here in this channel will give us an opportunity to a naturally expressed heat to AI them for the first time by 80 days in milk. These cows don't give us the opportunity to inseminate them to a natural heat until after 80 days in milk. So this is the signal from the cow that I'm either in this channel or this channel here. Now, if we're managing a dairy herd, we'd quite clearly like 100% of our cows to come down this channel. But I can stand here quite confidently and tell you that even in the best managed herds I've worked with around the world, 
we only really ever get a maximum of 85% of the cows coming down this channel. So we're always going to have somewhere in the region of 15 to 20% of our cows, maybe a few more, in this channel here. What I'm really presenting to you here, and what I'm trying to get across here, is that reproductive failure in dairy cows is a metabolic disease. And it's a metabolic disease that actually happens before the cow calves. It's already pre-decided which of these two channels a cow is going to take on the day that she calves. So let's ask ourselves the question, how do we get a cow to move from this channel into this channel? What can we do? Aside from our transition cow management, what can we actually do for these cows? Well, your fresh cow program is immensely important. The reason you saw those guys doing all that work with those fresh cows on those early slides is that by doing that work in that early fresh period, the first few days after calving, they know they can actually get cows to shift from there to there. They can move them from that channel into that channel. Yeah. Your other opportunity to move cows from this channel to this channel occurs here at round about 80 days in milk. And you can argue whether that should be 70 days or whether it should be 80 days in milk. Certainly in my world, it's 80 days in milk. And the feature that makes a difference to these cows that moves them from this channel into this channel is if they get an ovulation synchronized. Okay? Not a heat, an ovulation. The epidemiological feature that moves these cows across from here to here is that somebody bothered to put these cows through a program that synchronizes an ovulation. So that would be, in its basic form, an off-sync protocol. Yeah. And those are really the only two opportunities you have to move cows from here to here. The other consequence of this kind of information is what does calving to first heat mean? It's a metric we've used in the industry for such a long time. But what does it actually mean? It actually means nothing. Because a calving to first heat interval is telling us nothing about the biological behaviour of those animals. So it's got no biological significance. If it's got no biological significance, it's unlikely to have any economic significance. And I really just want to sort of strengthen this point. What I've got for you here is six herds. They're all UK dairy herds. They're all more than 500 cows. And they're all giving more than 9,000 kilos of milk on a 300-day lactation. This is days in milk along the bottom. And this is the percentage of the herd that's been inseminated for the first time. So you can see we have a cluster of herds here where round about 80% of the cows have been inseminated for the first time by 80 days in milk. The management of the biology of those cows on those dairies is what I would describe as normal. Those farmers are doing a pretty decent job of preparing those cows, bring them into lactation, keep them metabolically stable, and get them inseminated for the first time by 80 days in milk. What about this herd here? Herd number one. He's obviously lagging behind the others, quite a way behind the others. So think back to some of those early slides, and I talked about broken biology. This is a herd with broken biology. You go into this herd and try and throw drugs about and put off-sync programs in, double off-sync programs, this feed additive, that feed additive. It doesn't work because the cows are not metabolically stable enough to respond to it and actually behave normally. You go into these herds and make those kind of changes, and you actually stand a pretty decent chance of getting a response and an economic response. Okay? This is broken biology. We just simply haven't got enough of the population coming through into lactation metabolically stable to respond in the way that we would like them to. So this days to first breeding, it correlates well with days to first ovulation and is a key indicator of future fertility. Cows with days in milk first breeding of less than 80 days usually are cycling regularly. 
they will give us the opportunity to AI them before 80 days in milk. And we generally find that on average, these cows have a calving to conception interval of 100 to 120 days in milk. It's the opposite situation with these cows. Days in milk first breeding greater than 80 are cows that usually show abnormal cycles. They conceive beyond 150 days in milk, and it's often well beyond. It's more like, on average, 190. And they become our problem cows. These are the cows that come out for the vet week in, week out. Okay? These are the cows that get you know, three, four jobs of estimates, prids, et cetera, et cetera, all the rest of it. There is one important uh, thing I should mention about everything I've said so far. It only applies if your heat detection program is effective. So what is an effective heat detection program? Well, an effective heat detection program should be capable of achieving between a 55 to 70 percent 21 day insemination rate or heat detection rate. 55 to 70 percent is what is normal for Holsteins. If somebody walks onto your farm and tells you they can get you a 95 percent heat detection rate from, a, from detecting natural heats, they are lying. Okay. So how does that fit in with a herd approach? Well, ideally, this is what I'd like, about 80% of our cows to resume normal cyclicity by 80 days in milk and give us the opportunity to, uh, to AI them. So what about the other 15 to 25% of those cows, the ones that are metabolically unstable? Well, traditionally, we've always worked with those herds and said, well, they're poor heat expressors, they might be cystic cows, we might call them an ovula, we might say they've got persistent corpus luteums. We've got a whole variety of diagnoses that we've really come about from our ability to scan cows. But the point is that all these things here are actually just symptoms of the metabolic problems that that cow experienced back at calving. They're just symptoms. They're not the actual disease. They're not the cause of the problem. So consequently, it really doesn't matter what those ovaries look like. The key feature, the key thing we should do for those cows is make sure that somebody actually goes in there and synchronizes an ovulation for them. Because what happens when we synchronize ovulation in those cows is they start to look like our normal healthy population. Yeah. I've said it kind of presses a reset button there, and that's kind of a sort of very simplistic way of looking at it. But if you're 80% of cows are back in calf by 100 to 120 days, what actually happens when you synchronize these problem cows is they also start to get back in calf by 100 to 120 days. And when you synchronize a cow, you get a very high percentage of returns by 24 days after the timed insemination. They actually return to normal cycling behavior. And what's interesting here is I talked about metabolic stability and obviously ketosis is an indicator that that cow is metabolically unstable. She's in negative energy balance. And what we actually find with ketotic cows is they are 1.2 to 1.7 times less likely to conceive to first service. Right? But if we actually synchronize these cows at 80 days, this number changes. Okay, It's not 1.2 to 1.7 seven times less likely to conceive to first service, it actually becomes a lot closer to just 1.2. And again, that just provides sort of further evidence that by going in there and synchronizing an ovulation in these cows, we can actually go about fixing some of these issues. And we should fix some of these issues because these cows have got these issues because of the way we managed them. It didn't happen by magic. And it wasn't the fairies that sneaked onto the farm and did it. I want to talk a little bit about the, the metrics we use to manage reproduction. And this slide really just highlights a few of the issues surrounding some of the metrics that get banded around in the industry. And it's just my imaginary 24 cow herd, sorry, 25 cow herd. 24 cows get pregnant at 100 days in milk. So they have a calving to conception interval of 100 days. 25th cow becomes pregnant at 150 days in milk. Now, I intended to get her pregnant. I meant to do that. I've been heat detecting her. I've got a straw of expensive semen waiting for her. I really wanted this to happen. Yeah? 
but your days open is now 102. A successful event has just made your measure of reproductive success look worse. Yeah? Is that a wise thing to do? Now, when this cow calves again, this 25th cow calves, if everything else stays the same, the day's open drops back to 100. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but when a cow gets pregnant, it's absolutely inevitable that she calves at 280 days. You have no management control over that, no influence whatsoever. So you now have a situation where the success made things look worse, while the inevitable event makes it look better. Yeah? And that's going on all the time when you're looking at data like calving to conception interval, calving interval, those kind of metrics. So I certainly favour 21-day pregnancy rate as a means for actually monitoring reproductive success. And this is a slide just straight out of the Dairy Comp software package. And this is the 21-day pregnancy rate for this herd, split down into three-week time blocks. Those are American dates. And it's just to show you how it's measured and how it's presented. And that's the summarising number at the bottom. And this is the insemination rate over here. A couple of things we need to understand about pregnancy risk or pregnancy rate is we measure it at 21 day time periods from a 50 day voluntary waiting period. And the reason we do that is if we do that, we have a correlation between this number and your future profitability. Yeah? So if this number goes up today, somewhere between nine and 12 months in the future, your ability to make profit goes up. If it comes down today, in about nine to 12 months time, on average, your ability to make money comes down. No other measure of reproductive success has that correlation. And that's what's really nice about pregnancy rate. The other obvious thing that's really nice, of course, is if the number goes up, you are more successful. If it comes down, you are less successful. So really just to highlight the, the point about the economics, this is milk per cow per day in the tank. This is increasing pregnancy rate. And this is the additional margin per cow per year as pregnancy rate increases. So what you can see is as pregnancy rate increases, milk per cow per day in the tank is going up and also margin per cow per year is going up. Now I constructed this graph at something like 180 pounds a tonne dry matter 25p for milk, um, about 7,500 litres or something like that per cow per year on, on yield. But if you change those parameters, all that happens to this line is it just either moves up a bit or down a bit. The shape of it actually fundamentally doesn't alter. The relationship stays the same. The other thing you should notice is that as pregnancy rate gets higher here, this starts to level off. So down here, as we improve reproduction, we start to grab more and more of the, the lost profit, if you like, that should be available to us. But as we get into the 20s here for Holstein cows, it starts to level off. And really, by the time we reach about 24% pregnancy rate and above in Holstein cows, we've captured all the extra profit that's available to us from improving reproduction from milk income. Okay? So this is kind of where you really kind of want to be sitting, really, 20% and above. Again, in most developed dairy countries around the world, average sits at about 14% here. And in most bullbred herds, it will be less than 14% and often starting to creep down into, into single figures. So again, that's just to emphasise the point about the correlation between pregnancy rate as a measure of reproductive success and its ability to predict future profitability. I've talked about metabolic stability at great length, and I've emphasised the importance of the role of the, the transition period, the three weeks before and after calving, um, in keeping your cows metabolically stable. But there are other times in lactation when your cows, for whatever reason, may become metabolically unstable. And really, this is just to illustrate the point about acidosis. That is the other key point in lactation when your cows may become metabolically unstable. And for sure, the first thing that dies in an acidotic cow is heat expression. 
This is actually a free access bicarb bunk. It's actually in California. And you see the cows are queuing up for access to this. Now these bicarb bunks should be used as an indicator of, your, of room and health. So if you have one of these bunks on the farm and the cows take two to three ounces per day per cow across that group, that's okay, that's not a problem. What happens on these dairies is if that suddenly shoots up to six or seven ounces per cow per day, they start an investigation into what might be happening with rumen health. As it happens on this dairy, it's actually 90 degrees when I took this picture. So the metabolic stability here for these cows is actually being caused by heat stress, not acidosis. Metabolic instability can also be caused by underfeeding cows. This is actually a pen of cows. They're all eligible to be AI'd. And as you can see, they're benefiting from the nutritional value of concrete. Yeah. If you're a cow in that lineup and you're carrying an embryo that's eight, nine, 10 days old, and somebody does this to you, what's gonna to happen to embryonic death? Th this is okay if the feed wagon's 20 minutes away, but actually the feed wagon didn't turn up here for about another four hours. Be aware that if your cows can't access feed for four hours, they actually start to become metabolically unstable. And you're going to increase your rate of embryonic death. It's kind of a critical four hours for high yielding cows. Again, just to emphasize the point, the jerseys were in America. This is actually in, uh, in Italy. And this is a, a farmer trying really hard to make his cows metabolically unstable. These are actually close up cows. In the first 100 days in milk, he gets the conception rates that he deserves, about 22%. And this is actually Germany. And these are far off dry cows in about a 1500 cow herd. And here, again, we can see the problem, cows without feed, so when are the cows being fed? Well, what we actually had to do on this dairy was actually go in and do some BHBs in these cows. These are far off dry cows and they were clinically ketotic. They had BHB levels above three. Yeah? Don't be surprised when you can't get them back in calf before 150 days in milk. Again, I'm kind of overemphasizing the point a bit, but I quite like pictures. This is actually the Czech Republic. And again, these are close up cows. And I'll agree, it's a horrible building. But what you can actually see here, these light patches, that's actually where the cows have licked feed off that barrier. Yeah. And these are close up cows. They're not supposed to be hungry. They're supposed to have poor appetite. But they're that desperate. They're actually licking feed off there. Now the worst thing on this particular farm was that while these cows were like this, the tractor driver who's supposed to feed them was sat on the scraper tractor, scraping out. Where should he have been? So this is the sort of stuff you want to see. These are actually close-up cows in the US. And this is breakfast, lunch and dinner, I presume. And this is the type of cow comfort that's being offered to them. Yeah. Again, this is an idealized situation, I suppose, because this is actually at Cornell University. So I've talked about days in milk at first breeding. It's absolutely critical. This is calving date. This is days in milk at first breeding. That's 100 days in milk. This is the typical picture you would see on a lot of dairy farms that aren't particularly intensively managed. What's happening here is that in this dairy, the guy is actually synchronizing ovulation in cows that haven't been picked up in heat before that point in lactation. And we see all those synchronized breedings happening just there. So I'll just flick back one. So it looks as if synchronizing ovulation is a good thing for these cows but it's got to be underpinned by a good heat detection program. Absolutely. And what I want to do now is actually show you why. I just want to give you a bit of a word of warning about sync programs. So this is days in milk along the bottom when a cow conceived, and this is the number of cows that conceived at that days in milk. So we can see a big chunk of cows conceiving between 50 and 150 days in milk. But look at all these becoming pregnant out here and cows out at 500 days in milk becoming pregnant. That's not a great situation, is it? What about this farm? 
that's only 300 days in milk, and here's a big chunk of cows getting pregnant between 50 and 150 days in milk. Yeah? Much better, tighter reproductive management. Probably synchronising some cows, hopefully got a good heat detection programme in place. Yeah. What about that? Here you can see the pregnancy is being produced in very, very strict bands. Probably as a result of a lot of synchronisation, it might even be 100% synchronisation. So what does that sort of situation start to look like? Well, on this dairy, this is the date along the bottom, and this is the days in milk when the cow is inseminated. Here we can see some synchronisation going on there. A lot of natural heats detected, but this farmer decides, oh, if this synchronisation is so good, I'm just going to go to synchronisation alone. But very quickly realises, oops, I've suddenly lost an awful lot of opportunities to get cows pregnant, so suddenly goes back to heat detecting again. Yeah. Now, these are actually just breedings, just inseminations. If I convert that data into pregnancies, so this is a breeding, it's the same data, the same farm, the green boxes are breedings now that became pregnant. So here are all your pregnancies, there's the period of time when he went to 100% synchronisation, and there he is going back to detecting heat again. Never miss an opportunity to get a cow pregnant, if you want to get her pregnant. So again, what is possible with 100% synchronisation in timed AI? Well, again, this is kind of a word of warning. The perfect situation, you start with 100 open cows. So at the first cycle, because you've synchronised them all, you do get 100% submission. And let's say our conception rate is 35%, which would be typical for many herds around the world. You end up with 35 pregnant and 65 open cows. Now, if you're not heat detecting, unfortunately, at the second cycle, you get 0% submission. So ultimately, that means there's 65 cows not bred, and so they're not going to be pregnant, which leaves you with an outcome of 35 pregnancies from 165 eligible cycles, which is a 21% pregnancy rate. And that's why your pregnancy rate is limited with 100% synchronisation. The reality of this on most dairies is that the implementation and compliance is rarely 100%. Does everybody do the right thing on the right day? We've already seen that on many dairies they don't. So OvSync's a three-shot programme, so you've got three injections to give, and if you have 90% times 90% times 90% compliance, so on each occasion when an injection is due, is due, nine out of 10 cows get the right injection on the right day, Instead of having 100% compliance, you suddenly ended up with only 73% compliance. You convert that at a 35% conception rate to pregnancy rate, and you're limited to 19 to 20% pregnancy rate. I really want 24. Yeah. At a 30% conception rate, it limits you to about a 16 to 17% pregnancy rate. And those are the limitations with synchronizing cows. It's a tool that we should use. And it's a tool I, I have no doubt we should use more often, but it needs to be structured properly in the programme, and we have got to have that implementation and compliance has got to be absolutely spot on. So take home messages from me. Well, the top one, reproductive failure in dairy cows is a metabolic disease. It's most likely that it happens before the cow calves. And that metabolic failure is a consequence of failures in management and husbandry. Like I say, it's not the fairies. Every cow deserves an equal opportunity to become pregnant and retain her place in the herd. That's what synchronisation at the appropriate point in time to the appropriate cow achieves for you. It gives every cow an equal opportunity to live. Being a dairy cow in a dairy herd is an easy game. You either get pregnant or somebody chops your head off. And sophisticated technology really cannot ever overcome the flaws in the management of the basic biology. Thank you. Did I get that right? Thank you. Um, thanks, John. Any uh, couple of questions we've got time for before we break for lunch? Is there any questions for John? Uh, Jonathan Stockton, Kingsway Veterinary Group. Um, 
Would you ever go below, or circumstances where you go below 50 days for poetry waiting period? Uh, excellent question. The, the reason we use the 50-day voluntary waiting period is because of the correlation with economics. Okay? So if a herd is operating a 40-day voluntary waiting period, we would still measure the pregnancy risk from 50 days because that correlates with economics, future economic performance. If they are operating a 40-day voluntary waiting period, we need to make two measures. We need to do the 50-day pregnancy risk and the 40-day pregnancy risk. Because the 40-day pregnancy risk tells them how well their reproductive program is performing, but the 50-day one tells them about future economics. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it's about comparing apples with apples. Yeah. Time for one more. Any other questions? John Miller, Hermitage, Holsteins. Um, mm -hmm. Regarding a voluntary waiting period, we operate a 40-day voluntary waiting period and our best conception rate is on those cows, according to Winterherd. Because I think that egg has been developing during the far-off lactation, early dry period. So that egg is a really good egg and it gets, gets conceived and implants nicely. An egg that you serve on an 80-day in milk, that egg is a little bit weaker, I feel, anyway. So therefore our conception rate drops a fraction and we're running a 21-day preg rate of 26.7% rolling. So I think that works. People don't serve cows early enough. They're scared to serve them, I think. Yeah, uh, excellent, uh, excellent comment. And again, I would say I, I don't discourage people from operating an earlier voluntary waiting period. It's just that if you measure your 21-day pregnancy rate from day 40, you're losing the correlation with future profitability. And we take it from day 50. Yeah, so, so, so you've got the economic situation there. So let me put it this way. If you... If you had a herd that didn't breed anything until 75 days in milk, right, but had a 31% pregnancy rate, but you've got a herd that bred everything for 50 days in milk and had a 25% pregnancy rate doing that, who's economically better off? It's actually the 25% herd. Okay? And, and you're absolutely right. Those cows that are coming in heat from day 40, if you've got a 26% 50-day pregnancy rate, you know, that's a really good indicator that your cows are in really good shape metabolically. Okay? So if you get a cow who comes in heat from day 40, why wouldn't you? <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, you know, no, nobody goes bust from getting cows pregnant too soon. That's kind of the bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Just like to thank John. Thank you very much, John Cook.